So, um, so again, welcome and thank you for joining us tonight on who we are, where we're going and all of this great stuff we wanna share with you. So for those that are new, I'm gonna give a little bit of a backdrop on who we are. And um, what we are is a grassroots organization. Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota started, uh, we're in our ninth year now, we're going into our ninth year, so nine years ago. Um, just a handful of us parents, professionals, and a couple educators that were concerned with the limited access to educational interventions within our learning environments for students with dyslexia. So our goal was to you know, educate, advocate, and empower on behalf of students with dyslexia and those struggling with literacy. And we, again, we, we began with a small but mighty group of parents and professionals and educators. And we started out with some policy initiatives. And uh, those are, those are, firstly, we wanted to have a cornerstone piece of policy that which other things could be built upon. So we agreed that a definition of dyslexia was necessary. And we accomplished that a number of years ago. So there's a definition of dyslexia in state code. We also had screening on that list. That is, as some of you know, we, we currently have a screening bill, which just began to be enacted last year during 2020. Not the best year to enact screening statewide for identification, but at the same rates, uh, it's, it's, it did happen. And, um, you know, policy is being implemented. Uh, in addition to screening, there is appropriate intervention on our policy initiatives. So giving students with dyslexia access to the appropriate interventions known to help them be successful readers. We also have professional development for educators. And as you guys know, this past year, we were successful in securing a $3 million grant from the legislature to make some of that professional development happen with the letters, uh, which is, well, we call it letters, but it stands for language essentials of teachers of reading and spelling. And then lastly, on our policy initiatives is to ensure access to assistive technology, both within gen ed and special education for students who are struggling with literacy and or dyslexia. So those are a few things about uh, how we started. And what I want to um, show you is a couple of our slides. At the core of our mission are children. They're, they're our why. They're the reason that we um, work so passionately and spend so many hours volunteering for um, individuals with dyslexia. Their future and their ability to reach their full educational outcome are, are why. And I also want to show you some slides here on our community in action. Again, we have a number of board me me members. We've got 11 board members. I'm really proud of the board members that we have at Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota because uh, there's a lot of longevity in our board members and the work that they do to, um, to bring about the organization and to serve the community. And so a lot of them have been with us for a long time. They volunteer uh, tirelessly, uh, including at the Capitol and speaking and with families and helping students and helping families to navigate educational environments as well as helping families to understand the law. Um, and how to use some of those laws. And so again, just kind of wanting to tell you a little bit about some of the things that we as an organization have done in our past eight years, going into our ninth year. So again, I had mentioned that we were successful most recently in uh, policy for letters. So language essentials of teachers of reading and spelling. Um, very soon, the Department of Education will announce how educators can access those trainings, and we're very excited to, um, to, to have a group of educators taking those trainings, and then the plan is that that will scaffold, so educators that become trained in letters can then scaffold up. They can become trainers themselves within their districts, which is really exciting. 
Um, in addition to policy, which we've had um, a lot of work in, we've done a number of other things with this community to serve parents and students. And some of that is, um, is you know, developing virtual trainings. We put on a number of those a year. Uh, we can bring in speakers for virtual trainings. Sometimes it's our own board members and professionals putting on those trainings. Recently, this past year, we had a education stimu simulation and um, that drew a number of people. In fact, so, some of the people who are on with us tonight were part of that. Uh, I'm sorry, that was the balanced literacy session that structured versus balance where it was an education session. Uh, we also do simulations in school districts. And so that is something that a couple of our board members, one of which who's with us here today, Kimberly, is part of doing. And she also leads our parent workshop. So we have um, every other month parent workshops for community members to get resource support and have their questions answered. So a lot of different parent engage, engagement things going on. Um, something that's been central to our mission from the very beginning is offering parents the ability to participate in our grassroots advocacy at the legislature. And that's a really important thing. So we've, we've really encouraged and supported parents being involved, reaching out to their policymakers, um, coming down to the Capitol, telling their story and getting their children involved in our rally annually. So that's another kind of community builder in our, in our organization. Um, so a number of different things going on, including some new things that we want to tell you about today. Um, one of which Kimberly is going to tell you about in a few minutes, so I'm going to hold off on that one. But we're really excited to, you know, as, as we've evolved as an organization, there have been a number of needs that, that have to be met and that we have grown to meet in the community. And so... One of the things that we are looking to do in the very new future is to bring on a program coordinator. So program coordinator, and this would be a part-time role at DDMN, but this would be an individual who essentially is going to um, pull together all of the things that we already do very well and kind of be the, the symphony conductor of those things, if you will. So they'll help to manage the programs that we already have, direct those, uh, bring volunteers on for, for those programs and um, you know, coordinate the different efforts for, for parents that we're doing, as well as implementing new programs. There we go. I was talking and not turning my slides. <laughs> So assisting families navigating um, educational environments with resources and also being involved in creating and implementing new programs. So this is something that we're really excited that we're at a place of being able to do and um, to be able to bring more to our community. And one thing I want to... Um, want to do is um, just say again thank you for being with us along this journey for all of these years a lot of you have been longtime supporters and have been there with us at the capitol anytime we've reached out for support asking you to connect with your legislator send a letter or testify you've been there with us along this journey and so when i think about the things that we've accomplished as an organization, we couldn't have done it without you. And we've accomplished those things because of you. And so, you know, today, one of the things I want to ask is that um, you also support us as an organization. So we're in need of support more than ever. And you have the ability to click the donate button in the email that you received or go on our website and donate. And we're hoping that you would consider giving $100. And if you can't give $100 at, at that level, we would be happy with whatever you feel comfortable giving. One of the things I want to do is introduce you to um, one of our board members who's going to share her story. And it's these stories that we work for. Um, and these are the lives that we work to improve. And Really just want to introduce you now to Michelle Kvikstad, who's a board member, parent of a dyslexic and a really important member of our community. Michelle? 
Thank you, Rachel. And it's just so fun to see as people are coming on. I see some familiar names and faces and my stories is not um, any different really than many of the stories I've heard of, of the people that are here on the call with us tonight. So just thank you for allowing me to share just a little bit of my journey that hopefully can maybe resonate with you or somebody that you know or somebody that you represent. So good evening, everyone. My name is Michelle Quickstead. I am currently a special education supervisor with a bachelor's degree in communication disorders. I also have a master's degree in early childhood special education, and I hold a director of special education license here um, in the metro at a public school. I've worked for over 25 years with children um, ages birth through first grade, and I've super supervised hundreds of licensed special educators, birth to 21. It may surprise you that in my college courses, I received extensive training in identifying children who have a delay in development, but very little preparation for how to help children learn how to read, let alone what to do when children struggle learning to read. The same is true for my colleagues. At one point in my career, I was a special education teacher in kindergarten classrooms. I had some students that didn't respond to the reading curriculum or the one-on-one -on -one help that I gave them. This is when I heard about Orton Gillingham, an instructional approach intended primarily for use with individuals who have difficulty with reading, spelling, and writing of the sort associated with dyslexia. This former school district did not have the funds for my professional development, but I felt strongly about learning these strategies. I used my own resources, and I'm grateful I did. A few years later, my first child was born, and by the time he was in kindergarten, I was able to focus on this language-based learning disability to seek an outside private diagnosis, again, with my own funds. It is because of the training I sought and the awareness I had that my son was diagnosed with dyslexia at the age of six. I'm grateful I had the opportunity to identify my son's needs and provide the appropriate early interventions. I implemented the Orton Gillingham strategies at home and over the years have spent thousands of dollars in tutoring and private therapies. My son is currently in eighth grade, receiving A's just this last semester, straight A's in reading, writing, and math. It's a miracle. I'm sharing this in hopes that the great state of Minnesota will provide the same opportunity to children and families early on when the interventions can make the greatest impact. Research and statistics show that our children with dyslexia often have a higher than average intelligence. So their difficulties associated with reading are not about capacity, it's directly related to their instruction. It's important to share that with all of my training and working as a licensed special education professional, I could not get the proper instruction for my son within the public school system. I'm grateful I found Decoding Dyslexia of Minnesota. This group assisted me with helping me understand more about dyslexia and finding the resources to help my son. DDMN, fondly referred to, it refocused my frustration and anxiety with purpose. They helped me find ways to connect with legislators, educate others, including school districts. Not all families have the knowledge or resources to identify their child's needs, nor the ability to navigate the school system. For more than a year, families have been faced with the pressures of COVID-19 and struggling to find ways to support their children's education. While school districts attempt to teach during these unprecedented disruptions, students with learning disabilities suffer the most. Even though efforts have been made, many children are not able to receive appropriate services to address their needs. The limited access to appropriate instruction has not only had a negative impact on our students' academic success, but also on their social emotional well being. Decoding Dyslexia of Minnesota has worked tirelessly to support families with information and resources to work through these barriers. In my work as a special education supervisor, a contract consultant to schools around the Metro and an elected board member of the Division of Minnesota for early childhood, I bring awareness to educators regarding the identification and instructional reading strategies that are essential to nearly 20% of our students. Remember, dyslexia is not about capacity, it's about an instruction. Not one teacher has turned down my assistance. In fact, they've all requested more. 
Teachers want to know how to help their students. They're relying on us to share the research and best practices to meet the needs of all learners. What students learn is only as good as what is taught to them. DDMN is giving us a chance to make a change for a whole new generation of readers. Children and families need your financial support now more than ever. Clicking your button to donate in the email you received by DDMN website and clicking donate, consider giving $100 or more, but please do what you can for our mission. When you don't donate to DDMN, you help kids read. Thank you so much for letting me share my story with you this evening. I wanna introduce you to a fellow board member, Kimberly Carlson, to talk about programs and tools that we have to share. Thank you, Michelle. Um, I have some exciting, wonderful news that I am really excited to share with you. But first, I should introduce myself. I'm Kimberly Carlson, a um, parent of two wonderful children. And I found DDMN um, when I was struggling with trying to figure out what the school system wasn't giving me what I needed. So I do this because I want to be the parent or uh, a part of a group that I wish I had to walk alongside me at the beginning. I didn't find DDMN until later on in our process. But I do lead a, lo a lot of the parent talks and different um, parent involvement. And I work with a group in our district as well. So I am really excited to share with you these new binders, they're a little glossy. Um, they're IEP and 504 binders that we created this summer and spring. And it was definitely a group effort. Um, some of what's in our binders is it teaches and reminds parents, because I'm sure they've seen this before, but it's a very overwhelming process of what records and documents to keep in the binder for their child, um, a place to keep notes at, for their meetings and conversations, and has a whole section on I, IEPs and 504, and what the difference is, and what should go into each one, and what they should look like. Um, we talk about screenings versus evaluations and how to read those evaluations. And then there's five full pages on accommodations and the wordings of what to use in those accommodations for kids. And it goes by categories. So there's general accommodations, auditory accommodations, classroom instruction, handwriting, spelling, math, um, lots of op wording options. And then how to write a SMART goal for your IEPs and what the difference is between a, a measurable goal and an unmeasurable goal. And we have reference pages in here on the current rules and statutes for Minnesota, Michael Uden's guidance on dyslexia and FAPE, which is free appropriate public education. And there's a couple sections on the MBE has for dyslexia discussion. Um, and just a great resource, not only with knowledge, but being able to keep everything together for parents when they go to 504 or IEP um, meetings. And we have printed out and assembled over 500 of these to give away to parents. So we've started that process. We had one event earlier in October to hand out. Um, we're going down to Rochester next week to the Reading Center, and we'll be handing out binders there. Uh, we'll be doing it again in December. We're, it's an open house style event for at Abel Seed House and Brewery. We'll be handing out binders and explaining, going through them with parents. Um, and all of our board members have a few stashed at their house. So if you happen to need one and can't get to our events, I'm sure you can let us know and we'll figure out where we can get one to you. Um, so it's, I'm just really excited about the effort and the knowledge that went into these binders. They, um, and they're free to, to give away thanks to a parent and support that we've gotten in the past. Um, we've got some additional, oh, did you have something to say, Rachel? 
Oh, before, when you're done with binders, don't forget to tell them about the parent tax you do. Definitely. Uh, I was about to say, we do have more upcoming events coming up and it's just a little bit of everything. So um, I have another parent talk coming up in November and this one will be for parents who are new to dyslexia. And it's just a great way uh, to be able to talk to parents in kind of a small environment. There's normally 10 to 15 people that come and uh, we teach them different resources and how to access those and they can have their questions answered. And there's normally a couple of us board members that are on at any given one. And we try to do those back and forth between um, new parents and then parents that have been on this journey for a little while that need to kind of bounce ideas off of each other of what's working and what's not. So the next one for new parents is November 18th. And we do have that up on our website under events. It's at 7 p.m. on Zoom. So you can join from anywhere. Um, and then also another excellent opportunity we have coming up on November 10th, we have David Flink from Eye to Eye, and he will be presenting. Um, he is going to be presenting the importance of social and emotional skill development and students who learn differently. And we have that also on our events page on our website. And that is at 7 p.m. also on Zoom. And these are all free. Uh, you just need to register and we'll send you links for signing up. So that should be an excellent presentation. I'm really looking forward to that one. Um, so as you can see, we do lots of different styles of events, whether it's presenting us and our knowledge of the board or getting different speakers in. Um, hopefully someday soon we'll be in person, but uh, the flexibility and wonderful thing about Zoom is you can join from anywhere. So, uh, and then we'll be do, think, doing more parent talks going forward. Uh, November is the only one that we have scheduled right now. Probably won't be one in December just because that gets so crazy, but then they'll start back up at the beginning of the year. Uh, another thing I just wanted to share was some of our key accomplishments. Uh, you know, Rachel talked about the structured and balanced literacy session or structured versus balanced literacy. That was an original content put together by one of our board members, and we had 245 participants. And it's on YouTube currently, and it has had an additional 310 people that have watched that as well. Uh, that we've done multiple presentations to legislators and community organizations, um, engagement talks to get just the information out and to educate people, people who may not be aware or have someone in their family that struggles with dyslexia. And then we educate and foster parents to participate in, participate in grassroots advocacy at the legislator and their own school boards. Uh, we can't do this alone. So we really appreciate it. I know there's lots of you on here who do that in your own district and come and speak to your own legislators. And we really do appreciate that. So and we're getting a, a more and more each day as far as supporters and followers. We have 3,800 followers on our Facebook page, um, over 1,300 supporters a database on our website. We have a parent support page that we run on Facebook, and that has over 550 members. We have a Dreaming Dyslexia, or Dreaming Dyslexic, I'm saying that wrong, excuse me, Dyslexia, Dreaming Dyslexia. Um, it's a Facebook page for our youth to youth engagement, of, and that has over 400 followers on it. We have an Instagram page and a Twitter page, and those each have a few hundred people on them as well. So there's lots of ways to get engaged um, and to find us. And hopefully some one of the events will speak to you and you can join us again soon. But again, our mission needs your financial support. So if you're able, we would love to have you donate. And you can do that on our website very easily. Or if you got an email from our website uh, advertising these events, there's a donate button in there as well. 
football. So Rachel, I'd like to hand it back to you. Awesome, thank you, Kimberly. Thanks for sharing all of the great things we have going on in programming and events and Michelle for your story as well. Um, it's all about the stories and the personal side. I know all of us are called to this mission through, through some story or another, we all have them. Um, and again, central, central to our mission is children and children being able to reach their full, um, full potential. So um, back to uh, you know, the program coordinator and just a little bit more about that again. And you know, part of us pulling you all together today was a little bit of the history of what we're doing, a little bit what we're currently doing, and when it when and it said in where we're going. We're not departing from legislature, just to let you know. Uh, Representative Dan Ellis, you're gonna see us around for a lot longer, sorry. <laughs> Um, we are there, um, you know, again, part of our mission is to ensure that there is a voice at the table when we are talking about education and there's a voice, strong voice representing parents and the students that navigate these environments that weren't initially designed with their needs in mind. And so we don't have an intention of, of changing um, legislative um, initiatives. However, um, you know, I don't, I don't know what this session will bring. I can't say that we have something specific, but I can't necessarily say that we, that we don't. Um, I'm under wraps for that right now. We do plan to remain involved in some of the higher education pieces. So that's the PELSB, the Professional Educators Licensing Standards Board, has been doing some work for, I think it's been about two years now. And um, so we're, we remain um, involved in that. We remain involved in seeing how letters will roll out as well as making any needed changes to ensure that screening kindergarten through second grade um, can happen effectively and that we're able to identify all students. And from there, uh, eventually, again, with those initial po policy initiatives, you know, we do want to ensure that um, we have uh, interventions that are more specific to students with dyslexia. And we also want to ensure that assistive technology comes into play at some place for students as well, because that can be a wonderful tool to support effective instruction. So um, in terms of the, the program coordinator, and again, that direction we're kind of moving again, we're just trying to ensure that we're as an organization, we're able to support parents and support the community need as it comes in. And we have found that there's more of a need for one-on-one -on -one, um, to be able to really have parents, have someone partner with them, walk them through navigating in those early years. Michelle, I know you had mentioned how difficult that was for you in the beginning. And thankfully we were able to be there for you. Kimberly, um, that was pre-finding us. And for those of you that don't know my story, um, right before I founded Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota, um, my son was diagnosed with dyslexia and he was in kindergarten. And um, that was through me. A lot of people told me I was being too tough on him. He was a little boy. He just wanted to play in the dirt and do boy things. And that I was comparing him to my older son who was already on a gifted track. And I said, no, that's not what's happening here. And I struggled with learning. And I watched my brothers go from eager, hopeful, happy learners to kids who had stomach aches every day and you know, came up with every excuse in the book to miss out on school to eventually becoming the behavioral children um, who, you know, they were labeled behavior, dumb, lazy, not trying hard enough, and eventually dropped out of school by the time they were in 10th grade. And so I knew as a mother, which I'm sure anyone on here who has a student with dyslexia has that same mother's intuition that drove them to um, seeking resources. So I knew that something else was going on. My son was diagnosed and then um, you know, decided that it wasn't just my, my child um, that needed help, that there were, um, in addition to my son and specific to my son, I was, I was thankful that I knew what dyslexia was and I knew that I would have to get resources, but it was very lonely navigating that and understanding what to do. And it was difficult as Michelle said, because it's, it's not available in school, unfortunately. 
And outside of that, um, my biggest concern was what about all of the rest of the children? We need to ensure that parents and students have access to, to resources. So knowing that we have families that need these things, we desire to, you know, to continue to provide exactly what families need and do it in a little bit more of an orchestrated manner. Right now, we've got a lot of wonderful people on our board um, and all of our board members are volunteers and um, we, we need to be able to invest in an individual who can help us a bit more to conduct and coordinate those efforts in a way that um, parents can get the everything that they need. So um, again, want to thank you all for joining us. And really, I would like to, um, Michelle, Kimberly, if you guys are open to it, I'd like to open up to questions. And we have just such a a nice size group that I think I would be okay with, you know, if someone would raise their hand, then we could call upon you. And then you can unmute yourself to actually talk human to human, which would be lovely, right? Um, so if you're not familiar with the raise your hand feature in Zoom, what you'd want to do is go down to the bottom in your toolbar. And there is a button called reactions. And if you click on reactions, you can see that you get like you, a bunch of emojis, you know, you can the person laughing, crying with tears, if that's what you're doing right now, if you want to send us a little love, or if you want to raise your hand and say something, we do want to hear from you. So, okay, now I've got two pages to watch uh, emojis for reactions. Mr. Daniels has raised his hand, Rachel. All right. Well, Mr. Daniels, go ahead and come off mute then. You know, thank you for the invite tonight. And I didn't know what to expect. There wasn't, I didn't, to be honest, I've got so many emails going by. I didn't read this one fully, but um, I can remember when uh, you ladies came into my office, I think it was about seven years ago. And, uh, and it was, um, I have to say that the, 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 being a mom of a person with a disability is the best way to get your point across because you guys were organized you were passionate you had your your figures and facts and figures together you know what you wanted and um, I can't remember exactly how many bills we got passed so far to, to help with that cause but I was just looking through uh, two years ago uh, bills were passed and then this last year bills were passed and uh, I don't think there was much done in the last two years. Can, can you correct me if I'm wrong? Yeah, so this past year we had the letters bill and then prior to that uh, was the screening bill and you were you were part of that too, Representative Daniels. And then prior to that, another one that you were part of was getting our dyslexia specialist at the Department of Education. I think that's when we first met you is when we were going after that. And that, you know, took a little bit of time. None of these, uh, as I believe you, you advised us, these things aren't one and done. This isn't a quick, easy, um, and that's some of the best advice um, we've all gotten um, when we were first starting down at the legislature is that it's it's not an easy road it's not quick um, good change takes time and it takes uh, you know a lot of other interested parties as well to kind of uh, so to speak row the boat together so yeah you've been part of of several and and uh, thank you so much for it I I I do what I can. This is a bad excuse, but when you're in the minority, I had uh, seven bills last this last session. None of them got heard in committee, so none of those are going anywhere. And the year before that, I had 27 bills, two heard in committee, and I think one was a dyslexia bill. And that uh, that actually was, I think, uh, chief authored by another author. Um, kind of the same type, two bills with the same content. And I didn't really care whose name was on it as long as it passed. So that one must have been the one for screening. Uh, yeah, yeah, screening that uh, uh, they put a must in the bill instead of a should or could. Or uh, so I'm glad that got passed. Uh, no matter whose name's on it, I, it was a good bill, and I'm glad it went through. But I just gonna let you know my my phone is always available. My when we're in the office, uh, my door is always open. So if anybody has any questions or concerns or ideas, you know, I'm all ears. So just want to let you a little shout out for that. And unfortunately, they've already made the rules for this next year. 
uh, the state building is going to be shut down to the public, which I think means the Capitol is going to be shut down to the public. So um, that really makes it hard to do our job, hard for you guys to get your point across. I mean, it's one thing to be on a Zoom. It's another thing to be in somebody's office and, you know, have your, your uh, everything in order for what you're looking for and how to draft the bill. And I miss those right. days. I, I, we, we need to get through this pandemic so we can go on to uh, business as usual and, and get some more uh, good legislation done. So that's that's my little yeah. piece, but my door's always open, my phone's always available. So anybody wants to uh, talk about something, just, just uh, get a hold of me. Thank you so much for welcoming the community to reach out to you, uh, Representative Daniels. And yes, we have been, you know, we've found Representative Daniels to be, just be so open. And this is one of the things that I encourage people to do honestly is, reach out to your legislators, you know, they were elected for you by you to be your voice. And um, however, they can't be your voice without you reaching out to them and helping them to understand what the issues are that you struggle with in your district. So, you know, again, Brian Daniels said that he's open to anyone that means regardless of district. So please feel free to reach out. Do Rachel. we have any yeah. Well, Nancy put a wonderful question in the chat that asked about the percentage of students who are eventually diagnosed with dyslexia. And I think that we have some great statistics that I would love for you to talk about, Rachel, because the impact is great. And I'd love for everyone to hear about some of the impact. Rachel, do you mind talking about that a bit? I don't mind. What statistics would you like me to? <laughs> well, one of the things, you know, when I first started this journey, it sounded, you know, educators and people in general just were a little misinformed about right. the, the prevalence then, and how often okay. this happened. Yeah, sure. I can do that. Um, so Nancy's question was rather specific. And so I was a little bit hung up on how many are eventually diagnosed. So there's a difference between being screened for and identified and being diagnosed. So diagnosis is something that's done only by a neuropsych doctor. And um, the, the sad thing is, is that um, well, up until we've had policy to do otherwise, the vast majority of students with dyslexia are being missed. Um, however, when, when it comes to dyslexia as a disability, it impacts 17 to 20% of our population, whether they're diagnosed and supported or not. A great many students are not diagnosed and supported. So I think it's like out of 100, you might have only 10 that are out of 100 that are dyslexic you might only have 10 that are actually diagnosed and get the it, you know and have some level of supports um just to kind of uh, i was looking for nancy's question so i could understand if i answered it but just to you know kind of share some other statistics with those of you that are here today, one of the things that really motivated me as a, as a parent who was, you know, again, it was the winter of my son's kindergarten year. By the way, he's a sophomore now. This is how long we've been working at this as a sophomore. He's 15 years old. He's going to be driving soon. Well, at least that's what he thinks. But at any rate, um, I was sitting on my sofa, you know, that winter and just feeling completely um you know, torn up that where so many students would not get the help that they needed. And it was some of those statistics that really motivated me to taking action on behalf of others. And it is that, um, you know, 80% of students who are in special education have a reading goal are there or might be um, on an IEP for specific learning disability. Well, if they're on an IEP for specific learning disability, and they also have a reading goal, there's a high likeliness that it's dyslexia. 70% um, of students who are involved, actually, you know what, let me start it this way. 44% of females and 54% of males who drop out of school fall into the lowest level of literacy. 70% of those incarcerated functionally illiterate. 60% uh, of our prison population, low, the lowest level of literacy are functionally illiterate. And then 42% of those who live in poverty 
low literacy. So that common denominator of all of those statistics that I just stated, again, literacy is a barrier for these individuals. And so when we think about like, well, how many people may have dyslexia or are actually diagnosed with it, we're only coming into understanding how deeply uh, a lack of literacy severely impacts our population. And so, you know, when we can begin to identify or screen every student and then match them to the appropriate services or instructors to give them what they need, we'll really be able to understand the impact. Oh, I see some questions coming in or something. Let's see, I have to read it. I can go ahead and read it for you, Rachel. Sometimes that's a little bit easier. Kate sh shared, speaking of reading goals, do you think it's reasonable that if influency is mentioned on an IEP for a ninth grader to help with reading comprehension, that we ask for a specific fluency goal on his IEP? I know he is a ninth grader, but no fluency goal ex exists on the paperwork so far. So again, how does fluency impact or how is that directly related to addressing interventions on an IEP? So this is where I am going to um, rely upon my fabulous board. So one of the things I'm not is, an, is a literacy expert. I'm an individual with dyslexia. I'm a parent of dyslexics and I'm the founder of the organization, but I do not have an educational background. I feel a little out of my depth in terms of IEP goals, um, it's, it's really difficult because it's specific to that child and what those evals show. So I know we've got Wendy Lunsgard on, on with us today. And if Wendy wanted to come off of mute and um, give a little advice there to one of the parents we have joining us, or even Robin Rovick, she's one of our longtime supporters, um, has been with us since the inception of de decoding dyslexia, perhaps Robin or Wendy would maybe want to give, um, give an answer to this parent's question. I'm gonna call on Robin since Wendy had to take off. So okay. she's no longer, if, Robin, if you're able. Yep. And, and we've also got Kimberly Dimitrica who's really fabulous with IEP stuff too. Um, sorry, I'm at oh, the hi, Robin. Hello, sorry, I'm at the kitchen table having just finished um, uh, tutoring, and so I don't have my mouse or anything. Um, in the re restate that question for me, please. Yep, Robin, I'm going to get back to it here for you. Speaking of reading goals, do you think it's reasonable that if fluency is mentioned on an IEP? So, for example, for a ninth grader to help with reading comprehension that we ask for a specific fluency goal on his IEP. I know that he is a ninth grader, but no fluency goal exists on the paperwork so far. Um, absolutely. The whole point of, of, of reading is to be able to comprehend. And a big part of comprehension is reading fast enough for your working memory to hold that information for you to process it. So fluency for the sake of just reading so many words per minute is, is pretty useless, but it is really important to be able to read, especially those higher grades, where you get enough content into your working memory to be able to process it, which is that's going to lead to your comprehension. I always push for a fluency goal. My, my gold standard is um, uh, Hasbrook and Tin, Tinsdale. I always get that because I knew somebody by a name very similar. Um, and they have very well researched and, and updated fluency numbers as goals at beginning of a grade, middle of the year of the grade and end of the year of that grade. And it is, it is a wonderful tool. And <clears throat> excuse me, um, it, is, it is used, I use it always in, in writing up the IEPs. And it's a really good tool for a parent to walk in with because they're, they're really solid numbers. And, and the, the folks that have put it together have been experts in this field of oral reading fluency for decades. And the nice thing is it's, it's, it's been renormed and is up to date. That's wonderful, Robin. When you have a second, if you don't mind dropping maybe that resource into the chat, 
for our listeners. Again, when I think about from a special education standpoint, again, as somebody who represents the schools, you know, we want to really individualize those plans, but Robin has a really good resource that can help be a little bit descriptive. So when you go into those conversations or you go into those meetings, you can really explore what fluency means because you really wanna get up to the, the points and the elements that Robin was talking about. And the instruction's only as good as the people that are providing it. And so sometimes we can get a little bit ahead of ourselves with what our requests are. We wanna make sure that the people that we're making the requests of are able to actually uh, provide that level of service. So to me, it's an and also. You really wanna describe what you're looking for with some of the research that Robin shared, but then you also kinda of wanna know what's the training and background and expertise of the people that are providing that level of instruction to make sure that, that it's, it's having the impact that you want. Robin, would you have anything else to add to that? Um, the one thing is to remember how fluency is defined pretty much in schools, it's words read per minute. And that is a very constricted view of what fluency is. Um, <clears throat> the term prosody is, is a very important piece in phrasing because that you, you, reading is meant to be more as if you close your eyes and did it as conversation. And we have natural pauses and natural breaks and inflection, inflection is huge. I mean, think of this, you can make, you know, when I teach kids about punctuation, um, you can have any any set of, any sentence be one that merits a period, a question mark or an exclamation mark. Um, you know, the dog is bad, period. The dog is bad, question mark. The dog is bad, exclamation mark. So you, you need to make sure that the, whom you're working with has a fuller view of what fluency is. And it's just not words per minute. Um, it, what it often does is teach kids to just read through a reading passage um, and there's no real comprehension. It's, it's how many words can they spew out in X amount of time. And it's, it's one of the things that ends up being detrimental because our kids are just trying to race through it. So that's an important piece is make sure that whoever is at that table, that you all have the same concept of fluency and what it means. Thank you, Robin. Beth jumped into the chat as well to share some additional ideas and resources for Kate. There was a question Carrie had shared in the chat about um, the exact path for computer programs that so many of our local schools are piloting this year. Um, Carrie shared, I cannot get my son out of this computer second English class, he's a ninth grader. So what do we know about the exact path of computer programs? Does anyone here have some thoughts or suggestions for Carrie? Oh, I'm not I tried to answer that, Michelle, and I wasn't really sure what the question, I wasn't sure if I understood the question, so. Um, I was hoping maybe Carrie might be able to come off mute and ex explain a little bit better, if possible. But while we're waiting for that, I did see another question come in from uh, Cassie Beldo. And, uh, and this was a really good one in terms of engaging the community. So what solid steps can parents and advocates take to ensure accountability within the district and the state, um, you know, like filing complaints, getting into world's best workforce. And it looks like, oops, the question just jumped. Curriculum committees, et cetera. Also, what are DDMN's thoughts on the page amendment? Okay, so I'll take the, okay. what st solid steps can parents and advocates take to ensure accountability? Well, I, there's a couple. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with one of my top favorite is, um, again, reaching out to our legislators and helping ensure that they understand, um, you know, illustrating the issue for them, because there is a group of policymakers, Representative Daniels is on the House side, we've got Chamberlain and Clausen and others on the Senate side. So there's a group of policymakers that work together and the more that they keep hearing from their constituents, the more that they can come to the table 
to help solve. Um, as far as within school districts and filing complaints, if it's necessary, Cassie, um, filing a complaint can be helpful. Um, I wouldn't advise anyone to do that just at, at whim, but there are times when, when complaints are necessary because of being out of compliance and, and being out of compliance in a way that is very harmful and detrimental to a student and their ability to access FAPE. Would I advise everyone to do that? No, uh, I, would, I would not take that lightly, but it is again, um, you know, a right of a student to have FAPE and if something has gone wrong that's impacted that, that a complaint might be an avenue to take. Kimberly, did you want to take the second half of that question, possibly? The, um, the page amendment? Yeah. I can speak Would you personally. Like um, I, I don't, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the board because we right. all have different opinions. Um, my personal thought on the page amendment is that accountability is going to be difficult there as well. Um, and they have some great ideas, but putting it all together and having it come to fruition might be where they have some difficulties. Well, and the other thing about that, thanks for sharing that, Kimberly. Mm -hmm. and, and on a personal note, I understand um, that you don't want to answer for the organization. So just to answer organizationally, we are not involved in the page amendment as an organization. We have listened to uh, what their goals are and um, you know, heard, heard what they're trying to accomplish, but as an organization, that is not something that we're involved with. I think that when you take things from an approach like the page amendment, like Kimberly saying, accountability is difficult. But the other side of that is that you're completely sidestepping the legislative process and or legislators who should be involved in this process. And, um, you know, taking it from a whole different perspective. And with that, I think it can be really difficult to um, come to fruition because of that. Okay, I did okay. see at one point, Carrie did unmute her mic. I don't oh, know if she's, there you go, Carrie. Okay. So um, it is a program that they sent out a letter this summer um, that my son was qualified for. And I questioned it since it was a computer program and he's always struggled with IXL. You're, I'm pretty sure you all know what IXL is. So um they sent me an email back and they said it's a computer program and a teacher assist program it's a one on two students instead of one on one it's usually one on two and the program is mostly done on the student's chromebook but the teacher will facilitate it the teacher will be able to monitor the students um so it's a new program and the English department had training on it this summer. Um, but my, most things, they don't really know how it's gonna go. So what I found out from my son is they're just taking them back, like they're bringing them back into grade school level English. Um, I've done the Susan Barton program with him for several years already. And so this just kind of irritates me because I can't get them out. And the principal called me on it <laughs> because my son said, my mom said, I do not have to do a computer program. So um, I'm just wondering if you know anything about it. I can't seem to get a lot of information out of them. So it's a lot of question it's a question with multiple answers and it's a ton of reading and it's about English, trying to get the kids to see where they stand in English and then they start all over with them. Does that make sense? So you don't know, did you say you don't know what the program is exactly? No, it's called the exact path, but um, so they're doing a testing and they're still testing him now in November 
<laughs> because he's been kind of bucky about it. So, but he had screenshot it and it was like a long um, paragraph and then multiple answers with two to three sentences. And then you have to guess which one it is correct. It's a lot like I excel in the English program. So, um, I'm not sure where it's going and if I was just wondering if you do anything about it if if it's worth fighting trying to get them out of this class or they'll put them in a full fledged English class. A lower grade English class and I don't feel that he is at that level. Um, I'm just wondering if you know anything about so, it. So this is really great. And this shows, you know, this kind of illustrates also what our organization is about, Carrie. And so it's really great that you bring up the question. I can't say off the top of my head, I know what program your son is working on. There's a couple of the different things that come to mind. It could be that he's in a fast forward program. It's a computer-based program that helps with literacy and comprehension skills. And a lot of school districts use those for kids that are, are having gaps. But without doing a further uh, intake with you and getting a little bit more background understanding, it would be really hard to make um, a recommendation that we would feel comfortable supporting um, without out, out the background knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. And so what I would recommend, again, this is, this is kind of where DDMN has the ability to help and um, you know, really provide that one-on-one -on -one with a parent. What I would recommend that you do is send us an email so that we can pick that up tomorrow and schedule a call with you and try to get a little bit more information and help you more effectively navigate and also um, do a little bit more advocacy for your son. Um, so I would be, if you don't have our email address, I'm going to pop it into the chat, but I would be more than happy to um, to help you through this and figure out what the next steps are for your son. Okay, that would be great. And, and honestly, thank you so much for coming to us this evening and for and for surfacing this. This is this is really great to um, to be able to help you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm um, actually Michelle or Kimberly, would you put the email address in? Because I believe we're at the top of the hour and we want to be observant of your time here this evening. We had, we had about 70, or 75, 45 minutes programmed um, and then opened up for questions. But I also wanna, you know, again, we wanna be observant of your time. This was meant to be short and sweet this evening. And so we wanna be able to wrap things up this evening and send, send, you, send you off, but also encourage you to join the programs we have scheduled next, next week. So I want to wrap up with a quote that um, has always reminded me of, of our why and our work at Dis Decoding Dyslexia Minnesota. And again, I want to I wanna thank you for joining us this evening. I want to thank you for your support and for walking alongside of us and being here with us on this journey. Uh, we certainly couldn't do the work that we do without you. And we certainly couldn't have accomplished all that we've accomplished um, at the legislature and with partnerships at the Department of Education and the Teachers Union without you, our, our constituents alongside of us. So thank you very much. And I'm gonna wrap up with, uh, with a quote from Margaret Mead. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that has. Kimberly, Michelle, would you like to say anything else before we? Just wanted to thank everybody for coming on and joining us tonight. Um, hopefully I'll see you soon in the future at any one of our events. Yeah, I would echo the same thing. We're in this together and together we're better. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us tonight and joining us in, in the fight for kids and families. And don't hesitate to reach out and let us know how we can help you. All right, thank you everyone. Have a wonderful evening.